Hello and welcome to our webinar, The Internet of Things, Marketing Opportunities for Security Industry Technology Suppliers. We've got a great program today and some exciting speakers to help us guide us through this topic. I'd like to introduce them by way of a little perspective. What was it like to be online in 1995? The popular public broadcasting show Computer Chronicles went into depth on a new trend, the Internet. The show offered advice on using a Mosaic web browser and on the best FTP sites where you could download your own copy. The show narrator enthusiastically told us that a successful web page had the upward potential to be seen by as many as 20 or 30,000 people every week. Around the same time, in the Internet's infancy, our first guest speaker, Martin Gren, had written a white paper on thin servers, a technology designed to provide plug-and-play network connectivity for non-PC devices, a precursor to the Internet of Things we see today. A few years later, in 1996, Martin's company, Access Communications, introduced the world's first network camera for security operations arguably one of the very first Internet of Things devices. We're honored to have Martin Gren, founder and director of new projects at Axis Communications. At Cisco Systems, the idea of the Internet of Things is so important that they have expanded the name and internally call it the Internet of Everything. We are also honored to have Cisco's Todd Baker, who serves as head of Internet of Everything product development at Cisco Systems. Between Martin and Todd, we're going to uncover the potential for the Internet of Things for security suppliers. Let's take a look at today's agenda. We're going to look at the Internet of Things in the security industry from a variety of ways. First, we'll answer the question, why now? Why are we talking about the Internet of Things now? Then we'll take a look at the Internet of Things today and a few years out, and also going to look at opportunities for suppliers in both new devices and new services. First, let's look at the trend in general. On a superficial level, it's all about the number of devices, independent of computers, that you'd expect to be connected to the Internet, that are now connected to the Internet. We see on this chart that while PCs laptops or mobile phones connected to the Internet will rise incrementally over the next few years, new devices are expected to grow exponentially. How will this trend affect the security industry? But to talk about something relevant in the security industry is trickier than in many. If we look at this Internet of Things chart, which covers many industries, and look at just the lower left slice, assigned to the security industry, we see things that we already know are connected to a network. In some ways, because the security industry has had so many devices connected to security networks, the Internet of Things is really nothing new. But there are some new things. Let's take a look at what they are. If we answer the question, why now, to the security industry, we can get a handle on this. The Internet of Things is really the aggregation of several trends we see here. The Internet becomes the glue where cheap sensors, big data, and smartphones and new devices all become connected to multiply the impact of one another. First, let's just take a look at the impact of cheap sensors. Since many sensors have started being built into mobile phones, their manufacturer's volume has gone way up and cost has come way down. In this article, we see the cost of some sensors has fallen to 59 cents in 2012, 54 cents in 2014. If it costs pennies to buy a sensor, somehow it's easier to build these components into devices. And the other thing is that sensors, sensor technology really is exploding. And uh, I know in the security industry, we're used to thinking about just the sensors that detect um, uh, things that are in common use in the security industry. But as we look ahead, as we start to think about what potential the Internet of Things has for a, a security supplier, it's worth noting that there's an awful lot of sensors being developed in uh, unrelated and, and tangential industries 
that may be able to be brought to bear into a security product that could add insight into the kinds of threats that are being uh, offered um, that our companies might encounter. Uh, if you just look at this chart, you can see there's uh, noise sensors, electromagnetic, ma electromagnetic level sensors, uh, smart parking sensors, waste management sensors. There's just all kinds of sensors being developed. All right, uh, uh, when, when the internet and new sensors and all of these uh, trends combine, I thought I'd just give a little um, perspective by showing some of the consumer products that are coming out. Some of them are a little crazy, but hey, uh, I, I wanted to share three of these with you. So here we have the Oral-B Smart Toothbrush. And um, uh, this basically it uses a mobile app on you know, someone's uh, cell phone. And uh, there are sensors in this device which captures data about your toothbrushing habits. Uh, a timer makes sure you've brushed a full two minutes. It also maps your brushing pattern so it can understand uh, where the uh, device is in space and can calibrate that to ascertain if you're brushing the top uh, layer of your teeth more than the bottom and if you're brushing harder toward the back of your teeth than toward the front. And if you actually want to get very ambitious about this, you can uh, automatically send this data to your dentist and have him uh, tell you about, <laughs> uh, give you advice on toothbrushing. Um, kind of like, uh, maybe, it, maybe it's a little no annoying. And Martin, uh, you uh, have some experience with this because your daughter is a, a toothbrushing challenge. Yeah, I've tried it. And, uh, I can't just motivate my daughter to use it. She doesn't like it anyway. I don't think she's a believer in IoT. Yeah. <laughs> well, just because you can create a product in IoT that can track and uh, identify certain behaviors doesn't mean you can get people to use it. So I'm not sure. I, I think I would find this product uh, fairly annoying myself. All right. Well, that's, that's one. But uh, again, think about here's a toothbrush, uh, you know, a, a, a device we're all familiar with, but you can add in timing sensors and uh, sensors that uh, can uh, uh, understand where the device is being used in space and suddenly uh, another way to look at things. Let's take another look at things. Here's a, here's a crazy uh, product where um, a health company won a patent for a pill with a sensor that is so small that a patient can swallow it and it will, mo it will uh, monitor when a patient is or is not taking medications. So for uh, people who are forgetful about did they take this medication and at this time, uh, this monitor will transmit data to a mobile device, a cell phone, uh, telling, oh, you forgot to take this pill or that pill. So again, a lot of things sensors can do. Uh, finally, the last example is what's called an IoT badge a sociometric sensor device, and this one actually borders on a, uh, a security application. Here's the uh, editor, one of the editors of the Harvard Business Review trying it on where they did an extensive review of it. And uh, this device has a number of sensors and uh, information gathering information, a microphone to record tone, speed, and volume of voice. It does not actually record voice. Uh, it doesn't actually record conversations. It has a motion sensor to measure movement, an infrared beam for tracking um, sensor so it can tell uh, the proximity to other badges. And uh, the reason this device was invented was uh, so people could sort of understand corporate interactions with business, uh, among business people and uh, colleagues. And um, what they, <laughs> one of the people says, uh, just by looking at the sociometric data, we've been able to foretell which teams will win a business plan contest. So basically, you are able to gather data from a variety of sensors, uh, uh, analyze that data, and start to predict outcomes, start to predict what could happen. And I think this is actually a pretty important um, idea within the security industry. So uh, that being said, what I'd like to do is um, just to go back to our panel and uh, ask, uh, what are uh, the opportunities for new devices? Todd, why don't you start? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Josh. 
So I, I'm going to take a couple different approaches to this. Let me actually take them in a little different order than you put them out there. New technologies. I think what becomes really interesting about the Internet of Things is it's not even necessarily brand new technologies that become important. It's actually using existing technologies in new ways and combined together in kind of new unique ways that I think will have the, the biggest impact in this industry. Um, as Josh and I were talking uh, a short while ago, one of the interesting security trends I'm seeing right now is leveraging sensors that are Wi-Fi sensors combined with more traditional physical security sensors like access control to actually create intelligence about whether somebody is really inside a facility or not. So you can begin to track the Wi-Fi sensor's location around a facility and correlate that with information that everybody's used to already around access control in and out. I mean, it's the old saying, you know, the badge is just a badge, it's not actually a person. So now we can start to say, hey, look, it's a badge plus somebody's mobile phone. I know that that's the Wi-Fi on their mobile phone or another sensor to do interesting things. I think that that's one of the things we should think about the most. Todd, you, you were talking about how anyone who was using a, an iPhone until a, a short time ago could be tracked down to their uh, their uh, iPhone identification number, and you could literally track an individual walking around a building uh, using that information. Yeah, I can talk about that a little bit more, Josh. So, again, as Josh and I were talking about the, this case that I just uh, highlighted, every phone – for instance, has, and every device that's connected to the network has this thing called a MAC address. It is a globally unique number. Every device that's connected in the world has a different number. And so it used to be that as you walked into a place that had a Wi-Fi connection, the iPhone would try and connect. It would probe the network, and it would say, hey, look, here's the SSID, if you're familiar with that word. Here's the network identifier. Well, at the same time, the network was actually seeing the ID of that device. And so although they couldn't identify it was you as an individual, unless you gave them more information, they could actually, we can still honestly track where an individual device flows through a facility. Okay. So what this means is you can combine that. It's kind of an augmentation to technology from companies like, uh, you know, Prism that does, you know, flow path identification inside of a video scene. Think about that, except everywhere that you don't have a field of view of video, you can now continue to actually track someone. Now, the good news is for all of us with iPhones, actually starting in, I believe it's iOS 8, don't quote me on that, they've actually added a new feature, which is uh, MAC address randomization. Instead of always using the same ID every time it touches a network, it randomly creates one. So it's a little harder to track people without their permission now in a facility, but just something to be aware of that's happening and probably, you know, most people don't even know. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. All right. Uh, Martin, what, what do you think about uh, all these new devices and um, how, how, how do you, what's your take on all this? Well, I mean, if you look on uh, uh, the history here, I mean, back in uh, uh, actually the early 90s, I mean, we did uh, print servers, which was basically attaching printers to a network, which certainly was on a very early IoT device, although we didn't call it like that. And then we created the what we call the thin server, which was, if you remember those days with Sun and Oracle, they had the thin client. And uh, what we did by then was the thin server instead. And we, and we wrote a white paper on that, which uh, is, is still floating around if you Google for it on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, now, that was the framework where we developed the world's first network-based camera. And uh, when we did it, it was way inferior, and a lot of people in the security industry were laughing at us. But it found great applications in remote monitoring by leveraging the power of the Internet. And uh, today, I mean, if you look in any enterprise uh, video surveillance uh, application, you will always find IP cameras. So actually, the Internet of Things is already here in video surveillance, and uh, that's just a fact. Now, when it comes to more corporate side, so how can we leverage further on that? 
Well, if we look, I mean, on like major uh, gardening companies, they have realized that demand gardening, that's no longer a growth market in uh, mature markets, I mean, like the US and Europe. So in order for them to grow, they need to make their cards more smart and more clever. Mm. And the way to do that is to leverage from technology. So by combining uh, guarding with technology and a lot of cool uh, IoT devices, they can actually become uh, more successful. I mean, just a very simple application. If you have a video surveillance application, and you see that the, the guy in the blue shirt and big ugly glasses is doing something bad. How about using just an IP enabled horn speaker and tell that guy to go away? A study from alarm.com says that 74% of all uh, burglars or uh, these type of criminal behavior actually disappear when they get an audible notification when they are not supposed to do what they're doing and somebody's watching them. That's very personal. I think we're fixing it. It's a very personal thing. Hey, you in the blue shirt, what are you doing? That's that's cool. Um, Martin, you've, you've uh, seen the, uh, the growth of the um, security networks from the very uh, beginning. Um, and, and my guess is ever since they started, they've always been getting more sophisticated. Do you think the Internet of Things is really something that's going to impact uh, security, or do you think it's just the natural ongoing progression? Uh, again, security networks have, you know, they were some of the first uh, integrated networks of lots of different devices, not just computer elements. Uh, so in some ways, this is not so new. So is, is yeah, this I agree. Uh, a, a camera with an analog ca uh, cable is, is, after all, a sort of a network. It's not an internet network, but it's a cable network. Sure. But, I mean, as I said, I, when I, whenever I give presentations or lectures, uh, because I'm nowadays from the security industry, so I call it the internet of security thing, yeah. because that's what I think is relevant to our industry. And that's why the reason we, we started developing uh, IP cameras, we do video encoders, but nowadays we also deliver IP-enabled access control, IP-enabled horn speakers, and even IP video door stations, where you have a remote gate and you want to, someone to uh, come in, let's say you're a car dealership and somebody's leaving or returning the car at night. Then you can use a door station, you just IP enable it, you just connect it through your regular video surveillance system, and you have some kind of uh, alarm central who can verify that the right person is coming in and granting access. Mm. So I think IoT is already here in the security industry, it's just areas where it differs. In video surveillance and enterprise installations, it's 100% penetration. Mm. If you look on access control, it's only a couple of percent penetration. Hmm. So it's certainly going to make it into the access control, physical access control pretty soon. Yeah. Loudspeaker, ma mass notification, I think both are markets that are coming pretty soon. Yeah. Maybe even the, the intrusion, but the intrusion is more difficult because it's so many legacy standards. Hmm. Okay. Todd, uh, at Cisco, you probably get exposed to uh, a lot of different industries and a lot of different uh, interesting devices that are getting developed. Um, uh, have you noticed any that you might have seen in other industries that might um, find their way into the security market or that uh, might have some kind of application in the security market? Yeah, let me, let me talk about a couple of things. So first of all, you know, I would agree with Martin, actually. The, the Internet of Things at its base inside the security industry, you know, it's there and it's evolving. Um, to, just to further that, I'm a big believer that the, the IP camera, the surveillance camera, is actually one of the richest and probably most underutilized um, sensor that's out there. The amount of data now with such high resolutions inside these cameras, I personally believe that we are just beginning to scratch the surface of what we can do to turn, you know, the physical world into a bit of a virtual world um, through analytics inside cameras and then turn that into one of the most ultimate sensors. So I digress there a little bit, but that, I actually believe that that's true. But when we look outside of the 
you know, true physical security world right now, we're starting to see emerging technologies such as LoRa, L-O-R-A. What this is, is it's a wireless technology, low power, high range. And so what you're able to do with this, you'll, you'll see it often in smart city deployments. So it enables you to put all those parking sensors, that great slide you had up earlier with all of those sensors on it. You can imagine how difficult it would have been a couple of years ago to truly deploy and make that picture real. Okay, so we're seeing new emerging wireless technologies that the sensors can operate on a battery for five years or more. You can get really wide geographic dispersion, especially in high density urban environments. It's going to give a lot more sensors the ability to connect and again, create these intelligent communities of information, if you will. But I personally believe the security industry is going to start using more and more and more. You can imagine pressure sensors combined with video cameras, combined with intrusion detection. All of these pieces combined is going to be really pretty exciting in this industry. Wow. I, I like to fit in there, Todd. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I like your analogy on the camera being one of the most underutilized sensors, which, of course, uh, uh, being biased, I, I tend to agree on that. But it, one of my favorite examples is how this ties in with big data. Because in video surveillance, uh, if you have, let's say, uh, a 15,000 camera system, which is a, it's, it's a big installation, but it, actually it's not a huge installation. But having 16,000 cameras, that's actually equivalent to YouTube. Because that's all the capacity there is in YouTube. Now, YouTube use cases mostly view and not upload so often. But uh, you can think of uh, YouTube as a video management system of 16,000 cameras. And just to give a perspective, that's the size of uh, uh, basically the amount of security cameras they have in, well, well let's say, a million citizen uh, underground system. <laughs> so uh, it, it's a lot of data. Wow. All right. Now, while we're talking about data, um, all of these devices, uh, and there's going to be a lot more of them and used in a lot of different ways, the thing, what, what happens when you install a lot of sensors is it creates a lot of data and a lot of data that's different, like, uh, you know, thermal data is different than uh, data coming in from an uh, IP camera. Uh, and it all comes back and someone has to figure out how to use all this, but there's such a massive amount of it, it, it can't really be done by having uh, people sitting at desks looking at things. Um, could you guys speak to the uh, issue of analyzing the data and, you know, teasing out, uh, you know, actionable uh, information, uh, sort of, you know, how, how that process is going? Uh, yeah, happy to do that. So we have a little delay in the call. Happy to do that, Josh. So. Uh, when we look at this, um, you know, if anybody's seen me speak before, what we talk about is kind of the, the hierarchy of needs, if you will. If anybody is familiar with this from their, you know, Psychology 101 class. But we have a hierarchy of data, okay? And what we see happening with IoT in all the industries, and this applies to, um, this applies to physical security as well, is there's lots of information that's being generated now more information than can possibly be generated and actually sent across a network. We, we just run into laws of physics that prevent that. So what becomes really key is taking that data out at the edge, doing some transform on it to turn it into useful information. If there's any engineers in the audience, it's, the data has a very low signal to noise ratio, so we need to get through that. And then as we view this hierarchy moving on, we take that information and you actually turn it into something called knowledge. And knowledge is, you know, intelligence about what has happened in the past. And then ultimately something we're referring to is wisdom. And that means the ability to truly predict based on what's happening right now what you believe is going to happen in the future. Now, in order to do this, um, I'm used to a world where when I give most of these talks about IoT, Everybody thinks of IoT as a Fitbit talking to, you know, a cloud service and you see it up uh, on the web. For me, it's a lot more than that. We look a lot at the industrial Internet of Things, real machines. And so it's actually impractical to send all that data up. So 
we look at the cloud and then another layer that's actually closer to the objects, which we refer to as fog. Okay, and you'll see that as a general term out in the industry. All it's really talking about is the need to put a little bit of intelligence out really close to the devices in order to do some of this processing. And you'll see that inside uh, physical security. Think of the analogy here as as simple as the DVR, okay? So the DVR sitting out at a remote site, storing all the video because you won't practically be able to transmit it all, taking in sensor data, you know, door trigger sensors, et cetera, and then accessing it on demand. Take that and scale it out to kind of the rest of technologies and sensors and inputs, and that's the model we're looking at. Yeah, so I, uh, Martin here, uh, I have one comment on this, and that is that uh, here I am sitting in Sweden with my home fiber network, which is actually normal nowadays in Sweden, 500 megabits up and down. I have no problem transmitting all the data of all my cameras up to the network and to the cloud. Uh, actually, that's fully possible with our Amazon cloud services and similar. However, uh, I 100% share your view that the processing has to be done on the edge in order to really be useful because otherwise it's, it's simply generating too much processing power and decentralizing and using the CPUs. I mean, you have uh, you, you have gigabit, uh, <coughs> you, have, you have so much processing power on the edge, yeah. and that can do a lot of stuff for you. Yeah. And then you need to tie it up into a system, because just having zillions of sensors, that, that's nobody going to be able to use. You have to have some software that puts them together, makes it user-friendly, so that the, the regular power-on, power-off switch actually works in a way that people uh, appreciate it. So that why you end up in the, like, like uh, some stupid rental cars or similar, uh, who, who you just can't figure out how they work. <laughs> all right. Yeah, Martin, it's, 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 let me comment on that, Josh. It's really funny. Before the call, we I were all for you uh, admiring. Bandwidth. <laughs> yeah. we, we, we were all admiring Martin's bandwidth before the call. <laughs> in a lot of the deployments that I, that, I, that I talk to folks about, for instance, uh, I'll use a word that people probably haven't heard in a while here in networking, guys, but a lot of the deployments we look at, think about deploying technology to like a uh, oil platform. Uh, one of the world's largest companies in that space I was chatting with about the challenges they have. They only get approximately 1,900 baud off of that platform that they can use for additional sensor data, any sensor data. And so what we're not really, you know, that becomes really the challenge that, that we see in a lot of enterprise deployments, et cetera. That's actually a fun application. When we did our first network camera, our first customers were in the oil and gas industry. And they were putting up network cameras on the oil platform, and they were looking for oil spills. And they made a hard copy print out of a picture the camera saw twice a day to show that there's no oil spill. And that saved them a five thousand dollar plane ride. Wow! <laughs> so that was an early IoT application. That's great. Hey, uh, Todd, uh, could you talk a little bit about when you when you start processing these massive quantities of data? What what is it that you actually look for? You had, in an earlier conversation we talked a bit about anomalies and things like that. Because uh, you know. Yeah. To, uh, just just so our audience doesn't think of it as a big black hole where all this data goes in, and uh, you could shine some light in there and tell us what actually happens. Yeah, absolutely. So I will tell you, and I told Josh, one of the favorite things for people to talk to me about is, you know, one of the hottest topics. We want to talk about predictive analysis and machine learning algorithms and all artificial neural networks, all these great buzzwords. End of the day, what I'm seeing the 90% of the customers I talk to really want to do at the edge in this processing is simple event correlation, okay? I can talk about the advanced stuff in a second, but it's really simple event correlation. Things like, hey, my glass break sensor went off, and, you know, my access camera showed me motion, and, hey, I saw the door forced open alarm went off. These three things guarantee me that someone has actually broken in and they've let their friend in the front door. 
you know, and those aren't hard to do. So don't think of it as necessarily rocket science that we're doing out at the edge. It can be simple, you know, processing and correlating of events. Now, you can go all the way to the other extreme, right? You've got companies that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, such as, you know, BRS Labs and others that I know that really do advanced um, anomaly detection. So they look at what's normal inside a scene or what's normal for sensors, and they develop that intelligence over time and then look for, you know, I may not know what just happened, but it's different than what I was expecting and generating alerts on that. So you kind of have the full spectrum that's available in the security industry from simple correlation, some of which is done today, okay, all the way up to this advanced anomaly detection, which, you know, we do see companies inside this industry doing already. Okay, great. Uh, Martin, one last question here on devices here for you. You, you work with a company and you've uh, introduced a lot of devices uh, that have been attached to security networks. Um, I was curious, um, is acceptance, how, how does it go when you introduce a new, yet another new device? Do people say, oh, I wish someone had invented that? Or is there a lag time between uh, just in general when you introduce a new device and people um, uh, uh, accept it? And, and I'm curious if this Internet of Things um, phenomenon has improved uh, sort of the acceptance of new devices or not? Well, it's, it's a very, it's actually a very interesting question, uh, Josh. I mean, what we what we've seen that when well, we introduced the the print server, yeah. which was an IoT device back actually back in '89, uh, people took it for granted. Well, well, you're running a Nobel network. Why can't you print on the network? It was so obvious that that product was needed. Huh. And when we launched it, it was no big thing. I mean, that's why there was no IoT hype back in the early 90s. Huh. But when we did the world's first network camera, I mean, everyone was skeptic, especially in the surveillance industry. And probably for good reasons. I mean, it took one picture every 17 seconds. I mean, a lot of things can, can happen in 17 seconds. <laughs> but we found other applications. We were seen as a toy company, basically, initially. Huh. But uh, when we introduce now the IP horn speaker, which I think is, uh, it, it really defines what the IoT is, because it, it's a horn speaker, you all know that, and uh, it powers using the Ethernet cable, and uh, you can configure it so it talks uh, zip, you basically assign it a phone number. So it basically integrates with anything. I mean, either like a regular VMS device, but also simply by calling the phone number, hmm. and you can speak and actually listen because it has a microphone that you can enable. Hmm. Wow. Uh, and when we launched that to our customers, they said, why hasn't anyone done this before? It's <laughs> so obvious. You have cameras, but you can't give the feedback information unless you put up uh, an audio server, uh, power, uh, amplifier, and the horn, which, yes, you can do, but it costs you a lot of money. Now you can simply buy a simple IoT device with that at all. I think it's so cool. Wow. So you gave us two examples. So, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look on, uh, for instance, the uh, intercoms, I mean, they uh, are also, it's a very analog market to price. Almost all intercoms, with a few exceptions, uh, are using either proprietary systems or analog systems. Okay. Now it's so obvious. You have a centralized VMS system where there is a guard or an operator looking at all the video. Why shouldn't they be able to let people in who knock on the door? Hmm. Yeah. All right. Uh, just so, again, this was absolutely – people said, yeah, why haven't you done that for a long time? You should have. <laughs> That's great. Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to change gears here a little bit, and um, we're going to – whoops – here we go. We're going to talk about services because uh, that's a, a, a whole new area, and um, uh, I think Todd touched on this. Um, but uh, here's the um, uh, CEO of Securitas, uh, the largest uh, security guard uh, uh, deployer in the world. And in his annual report released this year, 
this is a quote from it, and he is describing how uh, he's realizing that labor is becoming more expensive and complicated to deploy, but technology is developing fast and becoming less expensive. And when you think about what a security guard does, um, a security guard uh, listens and watches and um, in, in essence, uh, uh, some of those uh, rudimentary uh, aspects of the service can be replaced by sensors and video surveillance cameras. And um, so uh, uh, Securitas and other guard uh, organizations are pursuing kind of a hybrid approach where they're uh, maybe deploying fewer security guards, but uh, using the uh, uh, a security network to kind of create an augmented service where that extends the capabilities of the uh, security guards that, that remain. So it's kind of a, uh, a way that the technology is being extended into a service. Uh, another part of, of uh, uh, the quote here from the um, annual report I liked a lot because uh, it touched on video analytics and intelligent cameras. And through the uh, use of analytics, you can sort of uh, map certain behaviors. And uh, after, after you sort of build, if you're, if you're gathering a lot of data on, a, on, a, on say, a, a manufacturing site or a, a factory floor or a, or a retail, uh, retail uh, show floor, you can kind of start to recognize when uh, a theft or a, a damage occurs, and you can and you can extrapolate that when that uh, behavior, whatever it is, uh, happens, uh, you might uh, consider that something bad is about to happen. You can kind of detect uh, uh, potential crime before it happens. Is the quote here? So I'd like to uh, shift uh, the, uh, the discussion over to. Uh, services, and uh, Martin, I think you were the one who told me about this, uh, this whole thing with the uh, Securitas uh, shift. Why, why don't you uh, pick it up from where I left it and uh, tell us a little more detail about it? Well, I mean, this is the security industry, and uh, we, made a, we, we looked at the market reports, and back in 2012, the value of uh, the, the U.S. Uh, security market as such, I mean, including guarding, was roughly estimated to be $350 billion. And that's a lot of money. And what's amazing is that the vast majority of that money goes into uh, guarding. It's actually only 6% of that budget that really goes into technology. And in both 6%, actually fences are included. Uh, so it's only a very small portion to go to, let's say, real technology, uh, high-tech technology. And a country like the U.S., who's so gadget-savvy, I mean, was so quick on picking up smartphones and stuff. So in the security industry back in 2012, that was only 6% of total revenue. Uh, and then I include the uh, uh, bended metal, basically, for the fences. So there's a huge opportunity to grow that market. And that's something that Securitas in particular is trying to drive. They set up as a goal that 18% should be uh, technology-related. And uh, now in the annual report this year, they said, yeah, we're going in that path, but we're not reaching the 18%. And the reason is that the video surveillance industry is quite conservative. I mean, it's been good at picking up IoT devices, such as the cameras in large installations. But if you go out to a mom and pop store, you will always see analog technology. Hmm. And uh, quite often you see the man with the dog, because after all, it's a great deterrent. Hmm. But the question is, does it really help? Hmm. I mean, if you have an alert, you send out the man with the dog, he will be there 20 minutes later, and that may be too late. Hmm. Oh. Okay. Todd, what, what uh, observations have you had about uh, services? Uh, are they on the rise? Is uh, uh, services that come out of uh, in Internet of Things uh, installation? Yeah, I mean, generically, the answer is absolutely yes. I mean, when we see the trends, and that, if you take – 
you know, the in the security space, if you take even the trend around things like the use surveillance as a service, right? I'm seeing more and more companies starting to, um, you know, look at that space. Uh, but then when I look more generically, um, what we tend to see a lot is people trying to enable data out of machines and other pieces, okay? And so what that looks like is somebody making a machine, shipping it out to a facility. They actually want to instrument it and then have that go to a service in the cloud. And then what they'll do is they'll, they'll offer things like um, preventative maintenance and other pieces. I know this is all a little bit outside of the core security focus of this conversation, but that's actually what we're seeing driving a huge portion of the, the rest of the Internet of Things is these additional services that people want to offer. Hmm. So I fully agree with you, Bert Todd. I mean, and thanks to the great Cisco technology, I mean, I have it in my house, in my summer house, I probably have more than 50 cameras streaming video to the cloud. I mean, I'm a firm believer in cloud technology. And I think actually cloud technology is great for the Internet as well. Hmm. Wow. So uh, getting back to Todd, uh, Cisco, of course, is a, a leader in the whole um, uh, Internet of Things, cloud technology. But a lot of people at Cisco sort of see the potential for the security industry to be uh, integrated with other um, uh, services that uh, if, you, if you view security as a service, uh, say in a, within a, a municipality, uh, other services might be water and might be electricity service and other things. Um, um, if you, could you address the, uh, the whole integrating uh, the security as a service into a, a larger organization like a city or a, a corporation. Yeah, and that's what's really interesting, Josh, is we, you know, because of, um, you know, the way we view the world, we actually view security as a component of a larger solution, okay? So when we look at it, we look at the layers of solution. We have the networking infrastructure and what that can do to support all of the devices that get connected. Then we start to look at applications and technologies that go on the network. So surveillance is a great example of that. Um, I always say, you know, I do work at Cisco. The more bits on the network, the better. We love that, right? And so security with cameras and other pieces and the number of sensors that are going to come is a great consumer of network technologies. And so we'll look at an industry such as, um, you know, you said smart cities. And we will look at the layers of technology and say, okay, what's actually needed in the infrastructure? Let's put the network in place. Now let's start thinking about transportation. What's going to be there for transportation? IP cameras, license plate recognition, smart parking as a service. Okay, as we move into connected real estate, what's going to be in that space? Cameras at entrances and exits, access control, okay? General out in the public as well. And there's some subtleties in here. We're, we're doing a lot of work uh, with companies in smart lighting, for instance. So using security technology, such as the cameras to detect, there's people loitering. And there's some interesting trends there, such as, you know, you may not realize this, but with outdoor lighting, municipalities spend an enormous amount of money on this. If you have one person in a particular area, they actually need a lot of light. Hmm. If you have two people in an area, they need less light. And the more people you get, the less light they actually require to be on. So you can begin doing intelligent things like dimming outdoor lights and saving costs on energy just by detecting, you know, the number of people in a particular area. And that's, that's kind of just an extreme example of going from, you know, security surveillance technology all the way through the network, up into a service in the cloud, and then doing a little bit of intelligence and analytics on top. To, in the end, what's it all about? Saving the municipality money and making people feel safe. <laughs> That's the full way we look at many of these solutions. Hmm. Okay. Todd, I'd like to ask you a similar question that I asked to Martin a little while ago, which is about uh, marketing. Now, you, you're exposed to a lot of different industries, and a lot of different industries come to you because they're launching or, or have uh, uh, Internet of Thing uh, type devices. Um, uh, from a marketing point of view, um, have you seen any success, uh, successful approaches that 
uh, these companies that you're involved with are, are doing? Do they uh, come out and say, we've got a new Internet of Things device and you should uh, buy it? Or, or do they just focus on the pragmatics of what it can do? Or h how do, how do uh, people launching, uh, you know, this is a, a, a webinar and the folks on the line are uh, people who are making uh, uh, technology for security systems. Uh, could, you, could you offer some advice on how you think they might go to market in terms of rolling out a new IoT type device? Yeah, definitely. So there's a couple components that we definitely see. I mean, uh, if you look at, um, you know, the Gartner hype cycle for <laughs> emerging technologies, so yeah. the latest one that came out in July of 2014, right? Yeah. Uh, Internet of Things is just right at that peak of inflated expectation. Huh. So the truth of the matter is there's an enormous amount of new products coming onto the market that label themselves as IoT or IoT enabled. Mm. The key what's actually behind that because in the customers we talk to what they want to hear is what you're doing how is it actually going to have an outcome for them that they care about and so truly linking i have a new sensor and because of this new sensor you're going to be able to accomplish something and that actually is going to save you money make you safer increase productivity that last piece has to be there in the marketing or else everybody just views it as more hype. Mm. That's going to be the key right now. Mm. Todd I mentioned that it's it's more important to talk about what a product does than if that it than it is an Internet of Things device. Uh, would you agree with that? Oh, I fully agree on that. I mean, I think what people nobody really wants a camera. I mean, they want better security. They want better control of their inventory. Uh, they want to, to know the, the cars passing by and stuff like that. That's what they want, the system approach. They're not interested in having a specific IoT device. That's what it breaks down to the tender and when you look deeper into to the, the problem. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, so it's really, I mean, that, the IoT is for the tickets, so to speak. <laughs> okay, good. Martin, uh, when, when, when I asked you that original question about the, uh, the devices you had launched and some were accepted immediately because people said, why didn't someone do this before? And some took quite a lot of time. Uh, I'm curious about the products that people said, why didn't someone think of this before? Uh, the truth is no one did think of it before, but you, you guys did. Um, how do you reach a point where you find that a little niche that everyone else has overlooked and you come up with an idea for a device, a uh, connected device. Um, is, there, is there any advice you could give to someone who's looking for that needle in the haystack? Or, uh, uh, well, I mean, uh, I quite often get that question actually, and it's one of my fa favorite topics. And it's always a problem in an organization, uh, small, but the bigger it gets, the worse it gets to innovate. And the trick is to have a very open-minded attitude to allow people with IDs to develop it mm. because there's usually never a shortage of IDs. That's not the problem. I mean, as many people you have, you get more and more IDs. Mm. The difficulty, that's always the middle manager because the middle manager, they have a budget, they have a timeline, time frame, they have a technology direction that they have to fulfill. And those guys, they are the ones killing all the ideas because they don't want this enthusiastic young engineer who has a great idea that he's working uh, on uh, his overtime with. Rather, they want him to be just one full-time average resource. Mm. And uh, the trick is to find a way to identify those people, to motivate them, and come out with cool stuff. And... In order to get them to the right stuff and right ideas, you have to expose them to the real customers. You have to participate and see what's going on for real. But otherwise, you just get up, get dreamed up product that really have no market. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Todd, like I, the toothbrush. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I, uh, one of the greatest quotes I ever heard about that uh, was from Lee Iacocca. He said, uh, love your customers, know your customers and ask them what's different in their lives. And he, he said that was how he came up with the Mustang and the minivan and all these things. But uh, let's move on. Um, Todd, uh, we're getting near the end of our – yeah? 
Right. I think, I think, Josh, we may have to start wrapping it up as far as uh, just kind of summarizing. We have about a minute left on the program. Very good. And uh, I just I wanted you to be mindful of that. And unfortunately, there are no questions, but we can certainly uh, uh, have the uh, webcast archived on the SIA website. And, uh, and, and we'll just have some concluding remarks, Josh. Okay, great. Well, I think we've had uh, some expert advice from two of the smartest people in this area uh, possible. Uh, Martin Gren was there from the very beginning, inventing some of the very base, basic and first uh, technology that could be called Internet of Things, even way back before there even was an Internet. And Todd Baker, uh, head of uh, Internet of Everything product management at Cisco Systems, has an amazing perspective on uh, you know, how this trend is unfolding. So I hope you got some good information out of them. And uh, we thank both of them very much for their time and, uh, and their wisdom. So uh, let me just uh, – uh, Kevin, I know you have some closing I, things. Well, I, I, I actually, go back. Leave it on that last slide, Josh. I just want, I'll close on that okay. last slide. Great. Okay. And, and again, I, I just wanted to thank you, Josh, but I also want to thank our guests, Todd Baker and Martin Gren, as you say, Josh. I also want to thank our sponsor, SDM Magazine. And finally, I want to thank all of you for tuning in today. Uh, we thought this was uh, kind of a – uh, a new webcast for us. We wanted to get delved a little deeper into uh, the Internet of Things. There are other events coming up. I mentioned the Securing New Ground. We'll, certainly we'll be touching on this subject matter at that event, October 28th and 29th. Please, again, check me out as far as my uh, – uh, please contact me, Kevin Murphy, kmurphy at securityindustry.org, as well as at ASIS. Don't forget our subcommittee on cloud mobility and the Internet of Things. Reach out to Joe Gittens. That's G I T T E N S. I um, apologize to my colleague for misspelling his name in the uh, uh, first slide. But otherwise, I think it was a fabulous uh, webcast today. I want to thank again all of you for participating, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.